I've been a fan of Bjorn's for a long time. Um, in a sense, he did the skeptical environmentalist. Yeah, Bjorn runs the Copenhagen Consensus that brings a Nobel laureate economist together every year, or, or is it two years? Um, it depends. And, yes. um, <laughs> and they look at the, at, the, at the chief issues facing the world and, uh, and decide and, and try and prioritize. This year the question was, you know, if you had $75 billion, how would you spend it? And it's uh, not exactly the way Al Gore would, but, but I, I, I don't want to give it away. Why don't you just start off by, by talking to us? and. Uh, uh, yep, sure. Thanks. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, both John and everyone, uh, for inviting me here. Um, the, the, the talk really is about why is it that the sexy ideas that we talk about very often are not the smartest ones, and why is it we don't talk about the smartest ones? Uh, and I'd like to take a starting point with something that's just about to happen. I don't know how many of you have heard it, and, and, and in some ways I think we'll find that that's actually a good thing. Uh, but the UN is going to run its, uh, its next a global environment summit in Rio in one and a half weeks. How many know of that? Yeah. Okay, so some have heard of it, uh, but but it's a it's a follow up. It's a 20 year uh, anniversary of Rio, the first one in 1992, where Bush Senior went down and we all went down, and and uh, uh, it was partly where where Kyoto was born and a lot of other treaties. And of course, that was actually the 20th anniversary of Stockholm. Uh, back in 1972 when we started thinking about environment. And I think there's some interesting points to be made there. And one of my main issues is really how we have moved from what was obviously good ideas to what is perhaps not so obviously good ideas or perhaps even bad ideas. The UN is going to try and sell us the idea that we need to move to a green economy because that's the way to move forward. Uh, and you know, you've got to wonder a little bit, is it really a good idea to buy stuff that's not quite as good, but you have to pay more for it? Uh, is that the way to move forward the economy? But there's, some, there's a good sentiment in the sense that we want to be green, and obviously we want to do good for the environment. The problem I have with going down to Rio at this time is that apparently the biggest issue is about dealing with global warming. It's about cutting back on carbon dioxide. Well, let's just run that by ourselves for, 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 for a second here. If we look at how many people die from global warming, if we look at all the deaths from heat waves, from floods, from hurricanes, and from, oh God, I'm forgetting one more, but you know, uh, uh, heat waves, I said that? Cold spells, maybe. Uh, no, not cold spells, because that would actually not, that would not be sort of the UN kind of way to think about this. But, but, but the... But the idea here is to say, how many people actually die from this? It turns out it's 0.06% of all, all deaths in the developing world. That's, you know, that's a, not an unsubstantial number of people. And we certainly want to look at that. What are the biggest environmental problems in the world right now? No, it's not global warming. It's simple air pollution and water pollution. Water pollution kills about 3 million people each year, or about 6.8% of all deaths. 6.8%. That's about 100 times more than what global warming, even if we take this very inclusive version of it. And how many people die from air pollution? Well, it's about the same number. About 2 million people die from indoor air pollution. Most people are like, what? Indoor air pollution? We've totally forgotten what it's like to be in most of the world most of the time. That you cook and keep warm by using dirty old fuels dung or cardboard or whatever you can lay your hands on, that's especially women and kids that are going to die in that. And then about a million people die of outdoor air pollution. So six million people, or about 210 times as many as even by this very inclusive way of looking at global warming, die from very simple, very old-fashioned, but unsexy environmental problems. Why on earth are we going down to Rio and saying, oh, we want to be all good and nice and uh, sweet, and spend huge amounts of money fixing a problem fairly inefficiently that only kills one two hundred and tenths of how much good we could have done elsewhere? And that's really, the, I think, the, 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 the access code to the stuff that I try to do, namely to try us to think about where can we get a lot of purchase on our money instead of where we can just do a little bit. Uh, Rio is one example. Uh, global warming is obviously a, a, a generally good example of how we, we worry about, somebody mentioned malaria, um, and, and it's a good example. If you read pretty much anything about malaria today, it's about malaria and global warming. 
Yes, global warming probably because it increases temperature, it probably increases the uh, extent where you would have malaria to be endemic, where you, the mosquitoes can survive. Uh, we're actually estimating by the end of the century we'll probably have about 3% more malaria because of global warming. But of course, there's 100% malaria right now. People die from malaria not because of global warming, but because they're poor. And the, 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 the thing that blows my mind is that we talk about malaria as a global warming thing because it makes it sexy. But the unsexy people who die from, from, from malaria just happen to be orders of magnitude bigger. Or to put it differently, because remember, uh, if we actually tried to do something about global warming, even if we did it fairly efficiently, uh, we could probably, for about $180 uh, billion a year, we could probably save a couple hundred people from dying from malaria each year throughout the century. Now, that's, that's not it, trivial. But, but it just strikes me as bizarre that we know we can pretty much eradicate malaria for about $3 billion a year. So to put it differently, for every time uh, climate change policies could save one person from dying from malaria, the same amount of money spent on malaria policies could save 36,000 people from dying from malaria. So again, my point is, why is it we're so focused on the one sexy death instead of the unsexy 36,000 deaths? And uh, wh what I'd like to see is that we try to make that sexy again, that we try to be smart. Is, isn't that supposed to be sexy? I don't know. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, this is not just within climate change. And we've done a few other things with the Copenhagen Consensus, and then we can start, uh, you can start quizzing me. But, but um, uh, we did a, a whole con consensus just on HIV. HIV obviously is a big disease, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. It's dramatically made, uh, made uh, 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 average lifespans decline. It's cost communities huge amounts of money. There's some very different ways to try to tackle uh, uh, HIV. One is prevention, you know, basically get condoms out. Another one is focusing on medical uh, uh, solutions like uh, uh, a vaccine or, or maybe a, a, a circumcision. And a third one is to get people drugs. Now, obviously, you want to get people drugs. We actually have antiretrovirals that'll help people. It just so happens that they're incredibly expensive. Even though the, the price has gone down dramatically, they're much, much more expensive than most of the other solutions that we have. But those are the solutions that are both easy and sexy in the public sphere. Here's a sick person, we're gonna help him or her. Instead of focusing on the much less sexy ones that are prevention or the ones that focus on long-term investment, for instance, in, in research on, on uh, um, uh, an HIV vaccine. It's not nearly as fun, but if it actually does a lot more, and again, what, one of the things that we tried to show was the investment, if you spend a dollar on, on, on uh, uh, treatment, you probably do two to three dollars worth of good. Oh, that's good, that's definitely better than some of the stuff we do with climate. But if you spend it on an HIV vaccine, you'd probably do about $20 worth of good. And if you focus on, 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 uh, on uh, prevention, you can probably do in the order of 10 to 20. Again, why is it we focus on the wrong things? And that's one of the things I, I would love us to, uh, to, to talk more about. And so fundamentally what I try to do is to get us off this feeling good, you know, doing stuff that makes us all feel good. You know, we put up a lot of wind turbines in Denmark they don't actually do very much, but it makes us feel really good. I would like us to do stuff that actually works. The thing that blows my mind is that we spend so much money on feeling good when I'm pretty sure our kids and grandkids are not gonna laud us for how beautifully we spoke, but whether we actually fix them. It's always amazed me that something like climate change is not really that sexy a topic itself. Wind turbines, you know, energy stuff, recycling garbage. I mean, the fact that people are obsessed with garbage is an amazing thing to me. I mean, what is it about that that gives it this emotional sort of religion? I mean, is it religion? Is it? I mean, what is it that makes that that makes people feel good doing that stuff as opposed to something practical? Well, I think if I could just take the garbage example, I, 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 that's another thing that blows my mind, and, and I think yours too. Is that, what is it that people recycle? Is recycling a good idea? Yes, sometimes it is. Remember, for instance, copper. We've recycled copper for the whole century because it's a smart idea. It costs a lot of money to get out of the ground. We have a lot of stuff uh, that, that actually lies around, especially if we uh, tear down buildings. Of course you recycle it. We've recycled about the same proportion all the way through the century. But that's not what we talk about when we talk about recycling. That's smart. No, it's about recycling paper and glass 
oh, wait a minute. Are we worried that we run out of trees or of sand? Sand is a big problem. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a renewable resource. <laughs> no, <laughs> that is actually true, but yes. And I, I think I know a place where there's a lot of it. So, so fundamentally, it's not the right things we worry about, but it makes us feel good. Again, it makes us... Uh, and and you know, you, I talk to a lot of people, and I, uh, uh, my sense is it really makes them feel like they're part of the solution. Well, part it, of the is it guilt, do you think? I mean, someone said to me uh, after I read about recycling, uh, one of the best explanations I heard for later was someone said that m people like to think of themselves that, that we're really spiritual beings. We don't need all this, all this stuff. You know, that we, we're really above all that. And that seeing all the garbage in their house, it, it, it's like lipstick on the collar of our love affair with stuff. And that's why you can't, you just want to do something with it to expiate the guilt. And therefore, I'm so I didn't really buy that stuff, I'm just recycling it, I don't really need that. And, and, and it, it, to me that's been an explanation for, you know, why this obsession with recycling and how much of that is going on with, you know, climate stuff that hmm. I, I can't burn this fuel, I can't do that, I'm, I'm, I just feel so guilty about using things that I have to somehow make up for it. Is that, uh, I mean, you well, deal with greens all the time. What do you? I, I, I think it might very well be the case. I, I, again, I try to bring in a rational argument, <laughs> yeah. so I have a very, very hard time exactly yeah. understanding it. But I think it's very much the sense of it has a personal, it, it's a personalized effect. I actually think that's one of the reasons why it's really hard to do something about climate even if you do it badly, as, as, as a lot of my opponents would like to do, it's very hard to convince people because it's not sexy to know, oh, I buy electricity that comes from a wind turbine. I mean, it looks the same, yeah. right? the light's the same kind of thing. So it, it, that's why I think you know, uh, uh, the thing that blew, blew my mind when, when, when we were talking a lot about climate was, I don't know if you saw uh, 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 Al Gore was uh, in, uh, in with uh, Oprah, uh, and they both went to Home Depot. <laughs> Uh, to fix global that. warming, uh, and, 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 <laughs> and they were just walking around. It, it looks very, they, I don't think they go there very often, but, but, but you know, they, they were just buying these uh, 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 compact fluorescent light bulbs, the uh, 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 lights, uh, energy saving light bulbs, and then they were like, hey, we've sol solved global warming. And that makes you feel good, because that you can actually do, or you can buy a hybrid and then you feel like, oh, I've really done something. And there's nothing wrong, we, I mean, we should be doing those kinds of things, but it's not what's gonna fix global warming. So we're stuck with these small solutions, these putting up solar panels on, the, on your rooftop. Germany has put up uh, the most uh, uh, solar panels in the world per capita. Uh, if you guys have ever been to Germany, you know it's a, that's a weird place to start. Is it an eyesore uh, there now as a result? Is sorry? It, is it kind of an eyesore, all these things on the roofs? And I, th I think so, but uh, some mm -hmm. people think they're very beautiful. They put them up on, on a third of all the medieval cathedrals. You're like, what? Of all the places, you know, anyway, but, 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 the, but the fact is they've actually spent $130 billion in subsidies and sunk subsidies for, for, for an energy that's worth about $12 billion. Uh, and, and the net effect of all that extra money they spent is to postpone global warming by the end of the century by 23 hours. <laughs> but when you tell people that, they're sort of like, ooh, yeah, the, we didn't think of that. Because you just feel like, see, I can, I can look up on, my, on yeah. my rooftop and see how good I am. Well, it's like a so, cathedral in that sense. You know, there's no is. practical yep. you know, value to cathedrals either. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good metaphor. Uh, so so fun, fundamentally, yeah. I think it's about realizing, and, and, and this is also one of the things that we keep saying at Code Making Consensus, when you, when you make all this sort of rational ana analysis, it's very, very hard to engage people who are fundamentally on, on this. In a, so on a how do you do this? Because you have been, been fighting this fight now for so long. I really admire your persistence at it. How do you try to get through to, the, to, to this sort of fundamental emotional side? I remember when Greg Easterbrook did, you know, did his book, A Moment on the Earth, and he, Greg was so, he really tried to come down hard. I mean, and you do it well, too, as far as talking to the other side, talking in green language. And he was just kind of terrorized at bookstores, and he just couldn't believe the, the religious fear on the other side. Now, you've done this for, for so many years now. How do you try to get that across to them? Well, I think there's, there's two things to it. One is to recognize that everyone in this conversation I think want to do good. So I I instead of trying to make it a them us mm -hmm. uh, 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 discussion, it's about all of us trying to do the best thing you can. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so when you say this 23 hours, uh, obviously the, the first reaction is no, no, that can't be true. But then when you, you, know, you take them through yeah. the, the calculations, there's sort of a little, 
hmm, because I actually want it to leave something good for my kids and grandkids. Yeah. And then you can start getting into this sort of conversation. And then if you can also give them alternatives where you say, well, instead of putting up this incredibly inefficient solar panel that's just not really going to do anything. Uh, by the way, w w one of the things that happen, uh, and we've seen this in Germany, but also happens elsewhere is, you can't subsidize your way out of this because suddenly, as soon as it actually gets popular, you can't afford it. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's destined to forever be a boutique little uh, 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 niche kind of thing. And that, those kinds of arguments really get them because they realize, oh, that's right, my solution is actually not ever going to work. Mm -hmm. And then you pull them in and say, L but there are other solutions. Innovation is what solved pretty much all problems. Do you, do you guys remember it back in uh, 1970 when we thought everybody was going to you know, basically run out of food and not have any more? The solution was not to ask, you know, we thought India was pretty much done for. The solution obviously was not to say to everyone, could you please eat a little less? That's not going to work. But what we, was the solution was come up with smart new varieties of, uh, of, 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 of food stuff, of rice, uh, of wheat, that actually produces a lot more. And of course, in the same way, the solution is not to tell everyone, could you please use less energy? It's about saying, can you eventually use a lot of energy, but without emitting the CO2? And that's about innovation. That's much cheaper, it's much more effective, and it's actually something that we can get everybody to agree on because we'd all love to have green energy that was incredibly cheap. Yeah. So let's focus on innovation. And the beauty, beauty of that is you can actually come up to people who are really, really worried and say, why don't we do that instead? And they'll typically say, oh, we should definitely do that. And a lot of other stupid yeah. things. But yeah, there you go. So spend yeah. $100 billion for solar panels on research and stuff? Yes, yes. I mean, that would actually make a huge difference. I mean, the simple point here is to say, as long as solar panels and wind turbines and all this other stuff is much more expensive than fossil fuels, you're never going to get people to switch. But if it was cheaper, we'd be done. Everyone would buy them. We wouldn't have to have a Kyoto Protocol yeah. or anything else. That's we would the just problem, though, right? <laughs> I mean, there wouldn't be conferences to go to. So what's well, the point? See, see, I actually don't think most people, well, I don't know for all of them, but I think a lot of them would like to not have to go to these conferences, actually have a solution. So, so the, 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 at, at the end of the day, it's about appealing to where you can do a lot of smart things. And then, of course, there's the other thing, the geoengineering, uh, looking at at least having an insurance policy. A lot of people talk about global warming and cutting uh, back on, on CO2 as an insurance policy because what if something really bad happened? But the truth, of course, is it's not an insurance policy to cut down yeah. because an insurance policy makes sure that you get your money back if, for instance, your house burns down. There's nobody to give you the money back if it burns down. What you can do is to make sure that you have technology that potentially could avoid a dramatic tipping point. Now, I had heard rumors that that um, um, uh, the geoengineering and doing this climate engineering uh, that it was being considered as one of the top priorities this year at Copenhagen. Is that right? Now it ended up being thir twelve on the list, I guess. Yes, right? yeah. yes. But it, but it had a very very good benefit cost ratio. I mean, the yeah. the academics themselves uh, said. But this this requires a lot of consideration yeah. of exactly how how damaging do you think it is. But fundamentally, uh, we have good reason to believe that if you could implement it and if it works. That is that we could basically uh, uh, shield off a little bit of the sunlight coming into the planet, uh, either by putting up uh, sulfur particulates in the stratosphere, that's what volcanoes do, or make clouds a little whiter. Uh, we could probably avoid all of global warming impacts for this century for about in the order of five to ten billion dollars. Now, remember, that's about a thousand to ten thousand times cheaper than what anyone else is talking about. Yeah. So it might be worth looking at. Yeah. Uh, now, we don't know whether it works. Uh, I find it amusing that the, you know, that the, only, uh, 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 that the only study that's ever been done was done by National Geographic because they needed <laughs> something for a show. Really? And so they actually they, they built one of these uh, 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 cloud whitening machines. Uh -huh. And you're like, if, if this is one of the biggest problems for humanity, maybe we want somebody else to do a slightly better study than <laughs> National Geographic. Not that I, you know, they're yeah. pretty programs, but you don't want that to be sort of where we run our, our, our policy business. But at the end of the day, this just simply shows us that there's much smarter, much cheaper ways to actually engage with the problem. And that, of course, also leaves a lot of other uh, 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 funds to open up to deal with these very basic things that we worry about with air pollution, water pollution, and all the other problems. Remember, the biggest environmental problem in the world is not air pollution or water pollution, it's poverty. Yeah. You know, about a quarter of all deaths in the world, about 15 billion, sorry, million people each year, about a Florida each year, 
die from easily curable infectious diseases. And that's because you're poor. And of course, if you're poor, you'll raise a forest to, to uh, uh, even to do slash and burn uh, uh, agriculture for, to, to feed your kids. And likewise, you're not going to care about the environment in 100 years if, if, if your kids mm -hmm. are hungry tonight. Yeah, that's lost. And now you've got a libertarian audience here. And, and so the, the question when you talk about helping poor people is, uh, for instance, it, it, uh, at the top of the list this year for some very unsexy things, but really worthwhile, of course, is the number one was bun uh, the, the, the most cost-effective way to spend $75 billion to help the most people was bundle micronutrient interventions, expanding subsidy for malaria was number two, then child, in child vaccines, uh, the deworming of school children. Now, th these are all wonderful ideas to do these things, but now th the question is how much can we uh, um, we want to feel good helping people and saving lives, or, or, um, but, but how much good can we really do for these countries? And I mean, how much good does international aid really do? Yeah, and, and that's a huge and, 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 and very, very disputed discussion. I don't think there's a simple answer to it because it really depends on what we do. Some of the things we do are incredibly good and some of the things we do are incredibly bad. What we try to focus on is there are some things that we know really work very, very simply. And let me just give you a, an example of the top thing because I, I think we haven't really realized how incredibly good nutrition can be. Um, back in the uh, late 1960s, early 70s, uh, uh, there was a big study in Guatemala where they did a randomized control study where they gave some cities, uh, some villages it was, uh, adequate nutrition and the others they didn't. I, I don't know how they got that past the ethics committee, but, <laughs> but, but the beauty of that is that we now, 40 years later, it's just published last year, can follow these guys. They're now in their, uh, in their 40s, and we can see not only did it mean dramatically reduced stunting, basically that they didn't you know, grow to be incredibly low and, 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 and somewhat undeveloped, but they actually both got better development mentally and physically. They stayed longer in school, they learned a lot more for every year they were in school, but, and this is the crucial point, now we know that they are almost twice as well paid as the people who weren't uh, uh, well fed. Basically, you become a lot more productive. I mean, it's, it's not really all that surprising when you think about it, but we've never really considered that nutrition could be such an important way. It's a way to solve undernutrition and stunting. It's a way to solve uh, 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 education, and it's really the best way that we know how to deal with education, but it's also a way to get people rich. Mm -hmm. And so that we can actually do fairly well. Our, how do you all, do that, all, Well, I mean, uh, there's, there's a number of different things. It's, uh, it, it involves making sure that you get uh, micronutrients. You get that on the vaccine days that we already have. So you're basically uh, uh, piggybacking on it. You get uh, uh, public information that we have fairly well demonstrated. Uh, that you, if you teach mothers that this is incredibly important to feed their kids well. And then in, uh, in schools, but on schools, these, these are uh, from zero to two years, so they're not uh, yet in school, but uh, you get them to go to schools like every half year and you give them a special paste and give them some extra uh, nutrition that will stay with them for quite a while. It's not you know, ideal, but it's the best we can do given the circumstances. Yeah. Again, is some of this money going to be wasted? Yes, but because it's an, a dramatically good investment, and, and, and the reason why it came out on top is probably the benefit is for every dollar spent somewhere between 60 and 100 dollars back in. Uh, so you know, we can afford to lose 50 dollars and still do very, very good in the, in, in the world. So the trick here is to realize two things, that we can actually do some things that will make immense amounts of benefits. But the, the other thing, of course, is to remember that there are some structural things we need to do. And that's, that's, that's my other gripe. And again, it comes down to the sexy, unsexy. Why is it everyone talks about Kyoto? That's just one city where we have one treaty. There's another city which we've totally dropped off, Doha. The idea of having more free trade in the world. Global warming basically is going to harm the third world and basically in 100 years. So it's not really a big threat for developed countries, and it's not a threat now, but it will be a threat in the, in, in the long-term future, and especially to the developing world. It turns out that free trade has much the same characteristics. Free trade, if we managed to get a successful dough around, according to the World Bank uh, models, uh, we'd probably be about $125 billion richer in, in the world. That's nice. Most of it actually go uh, to the rich world because we're best poised to, uh, to take the advantage of it. But it's not very much. But what it would do is it would start meaning that we would grow faster because you didn't have to reinvent the, uh, the wheel all the time. You'd actually be able to buy it from someone else. So you'd get 
faster growth. And so the dynamic models from the World Bank estimate that towards the end of the century, we would, on average, per year, be about $5,000 billion richer. Most, three, three quarters to four fifths, would go to the developing world. So we're basically talking about if we don't do something about global warming, we will mainly harm the third world in 100 years. But if we don't do something about Doha, we'll mainly harm the developing world in 100 years. And the curious fact is that Doha would be about 10 times better than any kind of climate legislation we could ever make. For helping the third world. For helping the third yeah. world. And of course, any realistic climate policy would be on the order of 100 to 1,000 times less good than a successful Now, do you make any there. progress when you, when you talk about something like that to, at, at colleges and the Occupy yeah. Wall Street, trying to tell them about free trade? How does one? No, no, it's, it's a difficult argument. I think at the end of the day, you cannot, if, if you want to move from something that's sexy, sexy is immediately obvious and people will latch on to it. Unsexy is not, you know, almost by definition. And so what you have to say is, this is not about getting it right. It's not about you know, moving everyone to that, oh, now we're smart, now we're uh, you know, fully informed. It's just about saying, let's try to not get it quite as badly wrong. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what I try to do. And I, I think in that way, you can actually succeed. You can get people to realize, ooh, that's right. And again, because you focus on People actually want to do good. They actually want to leave a better planet for their kids and grandkids. And so if you start talking about, well, what you're doing right now is not working. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, uh, the, uh, I think when I, when I talk to Greens, the, the best example is really to say, we've been talking about global warming for 20 years. We've been trying Kyoto for 20 years. So that's not entirely true, but that sort of uh, 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 approach for 20 years. It's not worked for 20 years. It's actually failed for 20 years. Do you really want to be the guy who said, let's keep doing this for another <laughs> decade? Yeah. Or should we try to sm do smarter things? So if you engage people in that way, I think you can actually get them to, to listen and to a certain extent change their minds and, and their policies. I think that's a great note to end on. Round of applause, please. It's impossible to hang out with these guys and not be smarter after the uh, half an hour uh, spent with them. 6.8%. That's about 100 times more than what global warming, even if we take this very inclusive version of it. And how many people die from air pollution? Well, it's about the same number. About 2 million people die from indoor air pollution. Most people are like, what, indoor air pollution? We've totally forgotten what it's like to be in most of the world most of the time. That you cook and keep warm by using dirty old fuels, dung or cardboard or whatever you can lay your hands on. That's especially women and kids that are going to die in that. And then about a million people die of outdoor air pollution. So 6 million people are about. 210 times as many as even by this very inclusive way of looking at global warming die from very simple, very old fashioned, but unsexy environmental problems. Why on earth are we going down to Rio and saying, oh, we want to be all good and nice and uh, sweet and spend huge. I've been a fan of Jones for a long time. Um, you know, since he did the skeptical environmentalist, yeah, Bjorn runs the Copenhagen Consensus that brings a Nobel laureate economist together every year, or, or is it two years? Um, it depends. It is, yes. <laughs> um, and they look at the, at, the, at the chief issues facing the world and, uh, and decide and, and try and prioritize. This year the question was, you know, if you had $75 billion, how would you spend it? And it's uh, not exactly the way Al Gore would, but, but I, I, I don't want to give it away. Why don't you just start out by, by talking to us? and. Uh, uh, yep, sure. Thanks. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, both John and everyone, uh, for inviting me here. Um, the, the, the talk really is about why is it that the sexy ideas that we talk about very often are not the smartest ones, and why is it we don't talk about the smartest ones? Uh, and I'd like to take a starting point with something that's just about to happen. I don't know how many of you have heard it, and, and, and in some ways I think we'll find that that's actually a good thing. Uh, but the UN is going to run its, uh, its next a global environment summit in Rio in one and a half weeks. How many know of that? Yeah. Okay, so some have heard of it, uh, but but it's a it's a follow up. It's a 20 year uh, anniversary of Rio, the first one in 1992, where Bush Senior went down and we all went down, and and uh, uh, it was partly where where Kyoto was born and a lot of other treaties. And of course, that was actually the 20th anniversary of Stockholm. Uh, back in 1972 when we started thinking about environment. And I think there's some interesting points to be global warming. 
if we look at all the deaths from heat waves, from floods, from hurricanes, and from, oh God, I'm forgetting one more, but you know, uh, uh, heat waves, I said that? Cold spells, maybe. Uh, no, not cold spells, because that would actually not, that would not be sort of the UN kind of way to think about this. But, 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 the, but the idea here is to say, how many people actually die from this? It turns out 0.06% of all, all deaths in the developing world. That's, you know, that's a, not an unsubstantial number of people. And we certainly want to look at that. What are the biggest environmental problems in the world right now? No, it's not global warming. It's simple air pollution and water pollution. Water pollution kills about 3 million people each year, or about 6.8% uh, of all deaths. And one of my main issues is really how we have moved from what was obviously good ideas to what is perhaps not so obviously good ideas or perhaps even bad ideas. The UN is going to try and sell us the idea that we need to move to a green economy because that's the way to move forward. Uh, and you know, you've got to wonder a little bit, is it really a good idea to buy stuff that's not quite as good, but you have to pay more for it? Uh, is that the way to move forward the economy? But there's, some, there's a good sentiment in the sense that we want to be green, and obviously we want to do good for the environment. The problem I have with going down to Rio this time is that apparently the biggest issue is about dealing with global warming. It's about cutting back on carbon dioxide. Well, let's just run that by ourselves for a, for, for, for a second here. If we look at how many people die from global